Good evening. On behalf of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society, I am pleased to welcome you to the next, uh, the next component of the AACS Virtual Fellows Symposium under the leadership of our president, Dr. Bill Levine. I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Gus Mazaka. Tonight's session is arthroscopic, I'm sorry, failed arthroscopic bank up procedures times one. What did I miss? What did I do next? Our moderator is Dr. Brian Cole. Our panelists are Dr. Albert Lynn, Kevin, Kevin Farmer, and Andrew Rikito. With that, I turn over the podium to Dr. Cole. If you have questions, concerns, please send us to the chat. And as usual, Dr. Mazaka and I will feed them at the, at the appropriate time. Brian? Thank you. So good evening, and I hope uh, you and all your families are healthy. Uh, I wanna especially thank uh, Gus and Ron John for their communication uh, to put this together. This is a yeoman's task, and it, well, along with Bill, everyone is really engaged, and um, as a moderator and uh, uh, the panelists that I'm working with, I will tell you that um, uh, a lot of time and energy goes into this. Uh, this is something we all really do enjoy doing, and um, it's, it's, part of, it's a necessary part of your education but uh, we should make this interactive. And uh, you have the opportunity now uh, to ask questions through the chat and uh, uh, our, our co-moderators will help navigate that so that we get to your questions and we'll do our best to leave time for questions at the end. So what I've done is I've, uh, we've asked uh, Albert, Kevin and Andrew to each provide a case and I've sort of uh, woven them together to drive some important take home points and we're gonna keep it basic. There's, not, there's really nothing tricky here. This is basic decision-making stuff that each of you in your training have probably seen already. And if you haven't seen it, uh, you're gonna see it when you get out. Uh, from a disclosure point of view, all of us are up to date on the AOS website. So let's just dive right in. This is a case that Albert Lynn provided and uh, very straightforward. Uh, this is a 17 year old male, right-hand dominant hockey player who was actually in season. And he presented uh, to Albert uh, four days after his first time traumatic dislocation that was reduced in the emergency room. His exam was uh, essentially uh, normal, except for what you might expect. If you put it in the ex abducted external rotated position, anyone who's recently dislocated is not gonna like it. And uh, when you provide a manual force, they feel a bit better. And uh, uh, his Baton's criteria for laxity was, was not present. So uh, this is a case of a fairly uh, straightforward, traditional uh, traumatic dislocation. And I just want to um, uh, ask the panel as far as what they're thinking out of the box. This is a not uncommon patient who comes into your office. And Albert, when you saw this patient, um, from a historical perspective, what were the key things that were going through your mind? You're going to talk to this patient, this player, probably going to have at least one family member there. What are the critical historical elements that you're thinking about? Because automatically you're saying, how am I going to help this person perhaps with or without surgery? You know, so I think when you think of a case like this, which is exceedingly common, um, the, all the risk factors that kind of go into your head, all the things that the ISIS score and things that, um, that are relevant here include, you know, the age where they're, they're in competition, he, you know, how competitive is he? Um, what's his, uh, you know, does he have laxity? Does he have bone loss? I, I think all of these things run through uh, was running through my head. Now, obviously, in a young kid who dislocates, you know, um, automatically I'm thinking, well, if he continues participating in collision sports or hockey, you know, his risk of redislocation is high. And so the question is, you know, we probably start thinking about whether, you know, to do further workup, um, whether to stabilize him early or later, and sort of when he is in season. I think all of those things um, are kind of running in my head as I'm talking to him and his family. Uh, Andrew, um, I'm, you know, from the social aspects of this kid who's in season, and you've got the parents there, and you're trying to decide preferences. Are there any key questions that you ask uh, the player, or the family? Because you know, much of this I think relates to sort of risk aversion. We all know there's a high potential chance of redislocation at some point. What are some of the key questions you might ask to say, you know, to help you help the patient, and the family make the decision? So I, I, I approach these relatively the same way in terms of having a very, very long shared decision-making conversation. So all, all these kids are, are not the same. Uh, this kid may have a lot of them. Um, I just lost. We lost Andrew. Andrew, I lost, we lost you. 
um, which hey, might- Hey, Albert, can I interrupt for one second? On this slide, you, you, uh, you talk about the Bain classification. You always do that for all your patients, and can you run through that? Hockey for and playing hockey, and this kid may have very little interest in continuing to play hockey. So I think it's very- um, Gus, one thing I've done in this situation is if, you, if, if we, the other guys turn their videos off, I don't know, or at least um, Andrew, I think you're having a uh, internet issue. If you turn your video off, you might get better throughput. Andrew, do you want to just test so we can hear your voice? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you can hear me now. Yeah, give it a go and we'll, I'll raise my hand if I can't hear you. So you watch me, okay? I think what I was saying, and please stop me if you can't hear me, um, I think it's very important to engage the entire family early, uh, whoever's there with, with, with the patient at the time of the visit, and really enter into a shared decision-making conversation. Uh, you know, these are all different. Uh, is this someone who has a, a passion, wants to continue to play uh, his sport, her sport, um, find out where they're going, or is this someone who is, uh, someone may not have uh, uh, aspirations to continue to play. So it's, it's really important, I think, to, to start this uh, shared decision-making conversation uh, from, from the get-go. Albert, um, Gus was asking about Baden's criteria. Are you just showing off that you know that laxity might matter or may not matter for the fellows? Or is this really an important thing? I'm not sure last time I checked all nine, and I don't even think I can list all nine, but maybe <laughs> that's just my ignorance. Uh, is it really important in your decision-making? You know, it's it's a known risk factor. It's a it's a known risk factor for failure. And so, yeah, I actually do for any any uh, patients of mine who I'm uh, assessing for labral pathology or instability, I do go through this, and it's very quick. Um, it's nine things. You know, you look at your elbow hyperextension, uh, your um, thumb apposition to your forearm, the pinky um, up at the ceiling, whether you can touch the floor with your hands and then recurve bottom of the knees. Um, it can be done very very quick, and you can often get a quick sense when you first see them, when you're examining them, whether or not they have some issues with laxity. But I think that's a, uh, a silent, um, kind of like a, can be a silent killer to, uh, to uh, your, um, re your results if you don't pay attention to it. If you had to pick uh, age, collision athlete, or Baton's criteria, what would you pick as the number one risk factor? Forgetting about whatever MRI or x-ray findings you might have. Definitely. Age, sports, or Baton's, what's the highest contribution to risk for recurrence, do you think? For me, definitely age. Yeah, essentially, I've often thought that age is, goes along with sport. And when you think about it, if you had a young person who's not engaged in a high-risk sport, maybe the likelihood of recurrence may not be as high. So I, I'm curious, the other panels, if you had to pick one of those three, age or sport or Baton's, uh, Kevin, what would you pick as, as, as sort of the, the highest contribution to risk? Yeah, I personally would, would probably lean more towards sport and, and the type of sport. So a contact sport, I would have a lot more concern about recurrence um, than I would in somebody who is not a uh, high-level athlete. Um, Al, is it safe to say that these x-rays, uh, true AP and an x-ray view, uh, are normal? Uh, yeah. Okay, pretty normal. So the next question I would ask, Kevin, um, would you, independent of what decision-making you're making in the office or maybe to help your decision-making, would you order an MRI, Kevin? Yeah, we typically get MR arthrograms. I think if you can get to it early and they still have a hemarthrosis, then I think a MRI in that setting is fine. But but I do feel that the arthrogram, at least in our institution, gives me a lot more information than just a plain what, MRI. What are you most likely to miss in a non-arthrogram MRI? What what are you really worried about that you might miss in this setting? A, yes, capsule? some sort of capsular injury, exactly. Yeah, capsular so do you, injury. So or, do you think you might be pushed to make a different decision, for example, if you had a capsular injury. Correct. Albert, uh, MRI with or without contrast, what's your routine? Uh, I agree with Kevin. I think if you can get it quick, within about a week from injury, you can do it. Um, it's a lot quicker to get and the hemarthrosis will act as a contrast. Um, but if you're getting it a little bit later, I will get it with arthrogram. Uh, and I think, I, you know, typically, even if I'm not gonna do surgery, um, I would get it now just for uh, the ability to prognosticate and to make sure that there isn't a other type of injury that you would act on a little quicker, such as so like what, a and Andrew, what about you as far as MRI? Would you get it immediately? Yeah, we get an MRI scan immediately without contrast. And we've been doing a lot of MRI uh, with 3D recons. So um, we have the software 
at our institution, I've been very happy uh, with uh, utilizing that as opposed to getting a CT scan. So it's no, no additional uh, radiation. Obviously, it's just an MRI scan, and, and we, we could do three-dimensional modeling with the MRI scans that we do yeah. here. Yeah, and I would, I'll just add, I don't, I don't get contrast either, uh, hardly ever, to be quite frank, unless it's a, one of our MLB players, and that's because there's an expectation. The worst thing that happens is if you don't, when you don't get it and then you get a more sensitive scan that may or may not pick up things that are relevant when someone else says, well, you missed A, B, and C. So we get it more for protective means. But my personal bias is that I think you can make most decisions with a non-contrast MRI almost at any time. But suffice it to say, I think it boils down to personal preference and there's probably not any uh, right or wrong answer. So the MRI was done without contrast and it was done subacutely. And um, so on the left, you're seeing the axial view. Um, I think what I'll do is just, Albert, why don't you tell us what you see here and I'll point to it if, you, if I can uh, yeah. for the benef benefit of our, our, our fellows. So, I mean, the, the, you know, what your cursor is on is in the anterior labrum, particularly you want to, you know, obviously when you're scrolling through, you want to make sure where your superior and where your inferior start with the coracoid, you know your superior so you can continue going down. It looks like a pretty straightforward anterior labral tear um, and his hill sacs lesion you know, looks relatively small. Uh, would so, you call that a true hill sax or a, a hill sax equivalent? What would you think? What do you think about that? I think it's a true hill sax. It's just, it's just small. I don't think it's, you know, it's definitely not a, uh, a off track lesion. And um, if you had a board question for the fellows, uh, the percentage of time you see any hill sax at all is probably about 85% or better, I would say, right? That's somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. Um, what about the outlet view? So the outlet view, you know, I think if you can, um, you know, some of us don't have the, the nice 3D ability to recon from, uh, with MRIs that Andrew has, but if you get a nice slice, so you can also get a good sense of sort of how, if there's any bone loss, um, uh, which I don't really see here. Um, and you can, if you get the right slice too, you can also see uh, any labral extensions up into the, you know, superior labrum up to the back. And finally, on the last view. Last view, you know, also a quick sense of the, of the nature of the hill sacs lesion. Obviously this is not the cut you really want to look at the, you know, the anterior posterior labrum, but you can look for haggle lesions or capsular avulsions uh, on, that, on that view. What do you well. think the best view to look at for a, a, say a haggle lesion would be, which you would, you know, out of all the capsular things, that might be one of the most common. Yeah. What do you think, what view do you think you'd see that most likely? I think typically the coronal view would be the best one to, to see that. And then you can confirm it on the axial views. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Forgive me. So let's, um, let's, I'd like, uh, Kevin, just why don't you run through with me? The family is sitting there and they, they, they need to know a few things. Um, what will you tell them about the risk of recurrence of this contact athlete dominant arm? Yeah, I mean, a 17 year old contact athlete, I mean, I, I would tell them the risk of recurrence is 80 to 90%. Um, you know, I would go through the pros and cons of, of, you know, obviously, I don't do a lot of hockey players in Florida, but and other contact athletes go through the pros and cons of bracing to get through the season. We know from some recent studies at the military academy that if they do recur in the season, there is a higher incidence of bone loss, so they need to be involved in that decision-making process if they decide to return and, and, and they have a recurrence. Mm -hmm. And um, what about um, from, from a, a point of view, if you're going to do non-surgical, how quickly can you typically get an athlete like this back? Somebody who's had a full dislocation, relocation, I, I know that from uh, NFL studies, they usually miss on average about six days from what I've seen. Um, there, is a, there is a correlation with the ASCS score. So if you're looking for objective data, you can, you can have a score and kind of get an idea. There was a study, again, another military academy looking at that. But once they've got full motion, good strength, usually they go back in a harness, which attached for, for a football player attaches to their shoulder pads. But once they've gotten good strength and motion, they get them back usually within a week or two, typically. Albert, do you know the exact mechanism of this dislocation? No, I, I, not really. I, mean, I think he was okay. checked and he fell into the ice. I think that's what happened, but okay. I'm not sure. Um, if uh, you were asked, look, by the, the father says, look, what's the risk of further injury if he comes out again? Because I'd love this. I'd love my son to continue playing. He's being looked at. What would your answer be? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, this is always a difficult uh, um, conversation because I think we know. I mean, we know there's several papers in the literature, including recent ones. If you fix a first time dislocation, their risk of recurrence is lower than if they recur. Um, that's just that's just what we know. But the reality is, is that these these kids want to play, complete the season. 
And, um, and so you, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm on it. I had to be honest with them. I said, look, we can play, we can finish the season, maybe address this afterwards. But if he comes out, he's going to have a higher risk as Kevin mentioned of other injuries, bone loss, other labral extension. Um, and, you know, most likely his, uh, his outcome is probably going to be a little bit lower than if he's dressed it right away. Um, now there are some studies that support if you dislocate a, you know, um, you, you get through the season, you fix it after the season, even with a um, recurrent dislocation, it, you might have similar outcomes, but I still think in general, probably, you know, your, your best chance of having a successful outcome is probably fixing it right away. But again, you know, that's, like, I, think, that's I think it's been, it's very interesting how there's definitely been a, a progression of the, the bar being lowered to do things earlier. And some might argue that's a self-serving decision. Some might argue that there's geographic differences, much like the incidence of spine fusions. Uh, Andy, you live in probably one of the most competitive environments uh, in the country. And you know, I wanna ask you objectively, I think that there is a narrative that I continue to hear that um, the risk of articular cartilage injury goes up. We all have often talked about the risk of caps or stretch and so forth, but and maybe that's the reason why recurrence rates may be higher if we wait than to have subsequent recurrences. But in your heart of hearts, do you think that what might or could happen is a driving factor for you to make an early decision, uh, even in a setting where the family may say, let's give them a chance to re re-dislocate again? Well, first of all, Brian, I, I think a lot of this gets sorted out just with your discussion with the family. Um, I think that um, if you look at this particular athlete and you look at his instability severity index score, you know, he's, he certainly uh, 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 gets a couple of points for his age and his sport, but he's not hyperlax. He doesn't have any bony changes uh, that you can see on his plane films. I, I think his score is probably somewhat, uh, you know, below five, let's say. Uh, and, and you may want to say, okay, uh, you can give this kid another shot. And quite frankly, I'm not so certain that that's the wrong idea. You mentioned New York and yeah, it's probably be hard for him to uh, walk a block before bumping into somebody who wants to operate on him. Um, but I still think you need to sort of enter into this conversation of, uh, you know, what, what, what would you do? And, and uh, this shared decision-making conversation, usually between the parents, the player and you, of course, they'll always ask the question, what would you, what would they do if you, if it were your son and that's always the difficult question, it was particularly for me because I have three daughters. But um, <laughs> I, I, I would I would definitely err towards towards surgery given uh, his age and his uh, uh, sport. Um, but I would make it very clear to them that this is certainly something that is not absolutely necessary. I'm not so certain that having a second dislocation is the worst thing in the world. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the key, and, and it's a matter of how risk adverse the family and the system is to actually happening again. And sometimes this is a matter of optics because, and it depends on the level of the athlete. The higher the level of the athlete, the higher the price the physician often pays when it comes out again for a variety of reasons. But when you get a 17 year old and you sit with the family and you say, look, if you are just completely risk averse because your risk of recurrence is exceptionally high, while there may be consequences, they may not be. And I think that often that risk aversion is part of that consensual decision making with these types of cases. So, in, hey, hey in Brian, case, yeah, Brian, please. can I ask? Can I ask you one question about this? Please. So, you know, what what do you guys think about JT and Brett Owens work uh, saying that that thirteen point five percent critical number goes up significantly after a second dislocation? So that's a, an increasingly used argument as to why we shouldn't let people have a second dislocation. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, so, you know, uh, Kevin, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? You know, uh, this attrition, maybe it's attritional, maybe it's post-traumatic. I think a lot of it depends upon the time between the index dislocation and the subsequent dislocation as far as how we see attritional bone loss. But uh, Kevin, do you, do you ascribe to the fact as one more point to push someone prevent them from uh, uh, having bone loss, which might actually change the operation you'll do downstream? Yeah, I, I do think it's part of your, your decision-making process. And, you know, you look at whether or not, you know, is he a senior? Does he have four years left? You know, are they going into the championship? All these things kind of go into the discussion. But, but I do think that families and athletes need to know that if there is a recurrence, that, that there is some evidence that that can be detrimental and, that, and they need to be able to make an informed decision in that regard. Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's like you have all these independent variables and we're going through our minds. And as the fellows out there, you're going to be sitting in this situation and, and all of them are contextual and are, and are part of the narrative. 
but as 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 Andrew pointed out, you have to sit down in a very unbiased fashion and do your best to simplify what you think you know about the problem because there really is more than one right answer for all of these athletes with a first time dislocation. The common theme is if they're gonna go back to a high risk activity, independent of age dominance and so forth, their recurrence rates are very high. So it's a matter of if and when they stay in their sport, what's gonna happen. And in this case, uh, Albert's case, he never dislocated again, but he was complaining a sense of recurrent instability. And Albert, I would ask you, uh, that complaint, I would imagine, has to also rise to a level where the athlete is saying it's troublesome. I have some might say I have a sense of recurrent instability and it causes no problems. But in your mind, I assume that that was sufficiently problematic because the next thing we're going to do is fix this guy. Um, so tell me about the fact that he never dislocated again, but your thoughts the fact that he's coming to you and he says, Look, I feel a bit loose, it's moving around, but it's never come out again. And I had a great season, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what you just said about it, it's not just, you know, the, the risk is so high. It's just, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, and, you know, and I, to, to Bill's point here, you know, maybe some of this, um, these issues with bone loss is, um, is attritional in nature in which, you know, they have these feelings of recurrence ability to get through the season. They're probably having some micro instability um, issues, if not, no, if, if they haven't had a frank dislocation. And so when they have instability enough to have a second dislocation, then that's maybe when you're starting to see those bone loss problems. And so yeah. this is always a worrisome, um, uh, this is always worrisome to me when people report this, um, that they've been playing through this through the season. Um, and so for him, given his young age is high risk, I thought, you know, we definitely need to fix this. Okay. So here he comes, um, panel, uh, Kevin, uh, let's just, uh, is it time for surgery? I know, again, you, probably, you might have to ask 50 questions to get there, but uh, are, is, are you, did he finish the season? He had a good season. He's having complaints. He's got the time to get better. I imagine would this uh, move the lever for you? Did you say, okay, acceptable, let's do it? Yes, yeah, no question. Okay. And Andrew, uh, he just finished the whole season. Do you think you got to study him again before you uh, operate on him? He never dislocated, but he has a sense of recurrent instability. He has a sense of laxity or looseness or instability. He's never dislocated. Do we have to study him again, or can we use a seven-month-old MRI? Yeah, I think in this particular case, if he hasn't had any events, I'm, I'm okay with the imaging studies that he's had. Okay. Uh, Albert, I'm curious, in the office, your physical examination, this is an office examination, which can be sometimes challenging with they guard, but what are the features of the sort of a laxity assessment? And this is not this kid, but I want to just use it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example that might guide your decision making in the operating room. So he comes back and you're examining him. Are there any specific things you're looking for besides the traditional things of abduction, external rotation, relocation, and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the earliest things is um, is uh, if he's had these recurrent issues, I lay him down. Um, I do a mid-level kind of um, mid-level abduction apprehension. Uh, you know, preventers talked about that as a, as a, uh, a key exam maneuver for particularly for bone loss, but other more kind of unstable pathology. He's gone through the season. He doesn't have that. Um, once he's in the exam room, you can do shoulder specific findings, um, including you can do a sulcus sign like uh, this has just showed. Um, but also tell me about tell me about how you do the sulcus sign and what the information is that you might glean from that to help make you make a decision. Yeah, I mean, sulcus signs start with the uh, with the arm um, in neutral rotation or um, uh, in neutral rotation and see if it gets better um, in external rotation. Um, I think uh, if if you don't get any dramatic improvement, uh, you know, you're dealing with a pretty um, hyper lax shoulder. Uh, you can look at hyper external rotation beyond uh, 90 degrees at the side. Um, that's also sort of a shoulder specific laxity sign. You can do a, ga a gauges maneuver uh, where you can kind of abduct the arm if it goes beyond 120. So even if a patient doesn't have clear baton signs, if you have signs of shoulder specific laxity, like those findings, um, you may, you know, it, may, it probably goes into your decision making about potential augmentation, grabbing more tissue, um, you know, or, or even grabbing tissue from the back, um, uh, even if there's no posterior label extension. Andrew, on the right is a, uh, just a video of, um, in the lateral decubus position, doing an EUA. And um, I'm curious what features of the EUA are important to you. And the fellows, I know you're always anxious to get going in the room and so forth. And uh, the, the, the biggest shortcut you could ever take that could uh, maybe alter your decision making is a failure to do a good EUA because you might want those, the features of the EUA 
at surgery to reinforce their decision making. So, Andrew, what do you use from the EUA uh, before while they're anesthetized, but before you put the scope in? So, a couple of points, Brian. I think first and foremost, you, you don't want to have the EUA really change what your preconceived notion was going into this. I think if you have to kind of scratch your head at that point after an EUA, there was a mistake made somewhere along the line. So, hopefully, it's just confirmatory. Um, just in terms of you know, I, I, I like to position my patients uh, in the OR and, and, I, and I'll, I'll examine them supine. I'm not saying that examining in the lateral position is, is a mistake. I just feel like I do a better exam supine, which is just the way I, the way I examine them in the office. So uh, I try to get in there before and then just participate in the positioning. Um, if it, uh, let me ask you a question. Sorry to interrupt. If, if uh, you know, I think it was Dave Alcheck who described this one, two, and three and one might be sort of normal translation, two could be to the edge. What if you, you examine him and he's locks, you know he had a traumatic anterior event, you know he has a, uh, a anterior inferior labral tear and everything else looks good on that MRI, yet he locks out three plus to the back uh, during that exam. Might that change your decision-making and knowing even when you get in there that you don't see any visible pathology, but you get him out to lock out the back and he's, yet he's never had a posterior dislocation he doesn't have a jerk sign. You know he had a single traumatic event, but you can get him legitimately three plus out the back. What would, how might that affect your decision making? Yeah, so then, then, then I'm thinking that there may be some component to bone loss here, and, and either I missed it or it happened during that period of time when he went back to play. Um, yeah, I, I think you know you that 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 may start to make you think more about doing something more extensive, whether it be adding a remplissage or changing things. Uh, completely, but at this point, you're probably committed to an arthroscopic stabilization. But uh, you, you may start thinking about doing some type of augmentation. Let's talk about positioning. Uh, uh, Albert, uh, lateral or beach chair for instability work? So I do all my um, uh, labor work lateral. Um, that's interesting because I sorry. actually trained. I, I, I trained completely beach chair. Um, I changed three years into practice uh, because I just felt like the visualization was so much better. I would agree. Mm. Kevin? Lateral also. And Andrew? Everything lateral. Yeah. I, I found it fascinating how, uh, Albert, where did you train? Uh, I trained at Pitt and at, um, at Harvard. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's always been, there's just been the progression of the East Coast being more beach chair and the West Coast being more lateral cubist for everything. And in the Midwest, we kind of do everything in the middle and choose what we think works best. But I've seen some of these contraptions that people do in the beach chair position. Um, to make it like a lateral. And I often wonder why not just do it in a lateral if you're, if you're struggling. If those of you are training in programs where you're doing beach chair, this is a good opportunity for you to learn this at the OLC or some of these courses because, because once you go lateral for instability, like, like Albert pointed out, that one video on the bottom, the, the ability to drive around the shoulder is exponentially better, especially if you're someone who likes to work in the back aspect post, you know, arthroscopically, nothing compares to the lateral decubitus. And if push comes to shove when you're just learning it, you can turn the camera just like a beach chair, and, but eventually you'll just gravitate towards the floor being the glenoid. So I would argue that it never gets easier than when you can do things in the lateral decubitus when it comes to uh, um, label work. I think it's dealer's choice when you get to cuff, but for this, where your distraction uh, helps imminently, it's a lot like doing hip arthroscopy with no traction. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Um, I want to just drive the point home about portal placement. Um, what can uh, Albert, can you just tell me your traditional, just mention what they are uh, briefly, traditional instability portals, please? Sure. I mean, usually um, I, I use a pretty high posterior uh, portal. Um, I actually don't like to use a suture management portal. Uh, I just feel like they always get in the way. Um, I think the panel can probably disagree with whether to use one or not. Um, so my posterior portal is high and lateral, um, so I can also use it for drilling. Uh, then the anterior um, uh, portal, um, I just make sure I do it under spinal needle uh, visualization so I can get trajectory for drilling. And then I often use, I can, I often use a high interval portal as well that can be used for- So um, you're two doing. portals anteriorly, one portal posteriorly, correct? Yep, you got Kevin? it. Kevin? Yeah, I'm the same, but I, I view from the anterior superior portal and my posterior portal is my suture management portal. Okay, and uh, Andrew? Yeah, posterior viewing portal, two working portals in the front. I make the uh, anterior superior portal with an inside out, but I go above the bicep, so I get that as, as superior as you can, like Albert said, and then uh, needle localize the anterior inferior portal, lateral and inferior to the coracoid. Important to keep those two portals 
pretty well spaced out. Otherwise, you get uh, crowding in the joint. I, um, I like the seven o'clock portal because you can get posterior in fairly. When I think Albert pointed out, he makes a high, more lateral portal that can almost behave like a seven o'clock portal, but when it's higher, you, it's a little bit harder to get lower. It probably relates to whether you guys do percutaneous or like to use put anchors to the cannulas, but I'm interested to know if any of you guys have any experience with the seven o'clock. I'm pretty much wed to it for all these procedures because it's good for suture management, it's incredibly safe. And, and it really does allow you to go around the corner if you're a believer in sort of the circle concept and so forth very, very easily. Although you can achieve the corner through percutaneous other techniques and suture passing. I'm curious if any of you have uh, utilized the 7 o'clock portal. Uh, I, anyone, Albert, Kevin, or Andrew? Yeah, I, yep. Go ahead, Albert, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't traditionally put a cannula there, but I often will use a perk portal there. Um, I think it's a you know good good trajectory to get to, to to that position. Andrew, yeah, a percutaneous portal there, but but if needed, you know, not not in every case. Mm -hmm. The access there, it, it's a great option. So Albert, we got to get to your failure. So let's talk about your index surgery first. What'd you do here? Uh, if you could just briefly uh, 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 just tell us your technique, uh, uh, suture anchor, how you passed and what you use, that would be great. And sure, what absolutely. absolutely. So, um, you know, this case, uh, he had a, he had a bank card from, from uh, 530 to, 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 to 3, 230. Um, uh, we felt like, I felt like I could see everything through both just the posterior portal. So I didn't really use um, an, a high interval portal. I just used one standard anterior portal here. Um, and so down below, um, we placed an anchor at 530, just using kind of a traditional uh, suture anchor tied, um, uh, knots at 5.30 and 5 and just kind of marched up uh, and used knotless uh, anchors at uh, 4 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you. And um, any uh, panel thoughts as far as uh, technique that was done? Uh, a fairly traditional suture anchor. You did a hybrid of knotted and knotless. Is that correct? Yeah, for this one. Yep. Okay. Uh, panel, why don't you just tell us quickly, um, uh, Kevin, uh, are you largely knotless or, not, uh, or knotted or do you do a hybrid? Yeah, I'm, I'm also a hybrid, so I tie knots down low, and then as I get to the equator, I go knotless. Okay, good. And uh, Andrew? I tie knots. Um, okay. I'm enamored with the, with the knotless technique. Okay. So um, this is another example, and uh, this is Andrew's case, and this is a 15-year-old shoulder dislocation during lacrosse. It was reduced on the field, complained of recurrent instability or subluxation, played seven, uh, and uh, played, uh, presented seven months later. And uh, his x-rays were normal. You see him checking for sulcus uh, at the time of uh, COVID. And um, this is going to forever mark these, our, our future pictures and videos are going to forever mark our history, aren't they? So um, yeah, and uh, good to see that you got the uh, N95 mask uh, taken away from the anesthesiologist. Good. So, uh, uh, but uh, good thing is everyone's safe. You're doing a good exam and he's got apprehension and he's got a relocation maneuver. And I think the important thing is here is your imaging, Andrew. And why don't you tell me a little bit about your thoughts? Uh, you did a CT scan and uh, when ordering a CT scan, um, I, I guess I'd like to know how common, uh, it, do you routinely order both MRI and CT scan in this setting? One, Andrew, what, what, what's your typical algorithm? So I don't, he came in with this. Um, so I was fortunate just to be the recipient of it, but I, I, I wouldn't typically get a, a CT scan in, in uh, in this patient, especially in a young patient, and try to avoid that kind of radiation, 15-year-old Okay, kid. Kevin, do you routinely or only do it in a situation where you're really concerned that you might be able to say ascertain by MRI? I don't yeah, think anyone's gonna get a CT rather than MRI, but correct me if I'm wrong, but adding the CT to the, to the decision-making. Yeah, it would only be case by case if I had concern for you know, wanting to make a decision on the amount of bone loss. Okay, so uh, Andy, you had the, uh, uh, the benefit of a CT scan. Did it tell you anything uh, that was helpful? No, okay. uh, no, no bone loss. Uh, All right, so uh, Albert, uh, you saw the MRI, you see a label tear, maybe something around the back as well. He's had uh, recurrent symptoms um, and uh, he complains of subluxation both in play and uh, in practice. And uh, would, you, would you treat this pretty much the same way as last one? I would, except I think he's got a much more significant uh, pathology. You can see on the uh, on that middle axial image, uh, there's there's posterior labral extension. He looks like he's got a superior um, labral extension, maybe um, on okay. that image there. So this could be a 270 okay. or 360 degree. 
Okay, so Andrew, I wonder if you wouldn't mind, this is a two minute video, let me see, yeah, two minutes, 24 seconds. Why don't you go ahead and narrate this? Yeah, so I set him up uh, lateral position. I like that distraction jack and I, I put the distraction jack in ahead of time just to make sure I'm all set up and then I take it away because I want to know that it's all set up in the right position as we get started there. Um, so I'm not scoping without this, the, 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 the distraction jack in place and then I'll turn the arm, a deduct it, and then it's right where I had placed it uh, during the setup. And you can see how that gives you really great access. The head is really a non-issue. Um, make my two portals the way I discussed previously. Um, you can see his uh, uh, subacute labral tear that you see here. And uh, we'll mobilize it, use the uh, various uh, 15, 25 degree uh, elevators uh, and prepare it. So I'm looking from the back, working from the front, alternating between the anterior superior and anterior inferior portal. That's the view. He did have a little fleck of bone, as you saw there in that, that picture, but it was, a, I felt was a fleck. And I'll mark out my anchor placement ahead of time. I do that for a few reasons. Um, I, I want to sort of plan out my repair. And I like marking it out because as you start to repair the tissue, you kind of lose sight of where you placed your last anchor. And it's uh, easy that, to drill out an anchor that you already placed. Don't ask me how I know that. Andrew, uh, let, me, let me ask you a question. Um, one thing that I want to reinforce that is important is you viewed from the front to see how good your preparation is and becomes especially important if these are coming in chronic to remobilize and recreate to help restore the anatomy. But I noticed you were uh, above the equator. What judgment call do you make when you're uh, marking your, your anchor sites uh, to say this is normal versus abnormal? Clearly the most variability is going to be from this point going that direction. So everything in this area has a tremendous amount of variability. What are your decision points to say this is normal versus abnormal? So, you know, yeah, you make a good point. You're gonna have uh, anatomic anomaly above uh, or variations above three o'clock. You have to distinguish between normal pathology. If it looks like there's been no cartilage injury to that area, if it doesn't look like the tissues have been traumatized above that area, then uh, you should be able to distinguish between what's pathologic and what's not. What you don't want to do is tighten up that tissue as you start to approach the interval area because you're going to restrict uh, external rotation, particularly in adduction. So yeah, there are some signs. Usually you look for cartilage injury, tissue trauma in that area. And you're starting in your first anchor placement. Can you tell us, you started there. How do you make that decision? Because I imagine you're going to go below there for another anchor. Is that fair to say? Uh, or maybe not. Maybe not. I didn't. I don't think I've watched the entire video. Uh, but you look like you're just below the equator. Are you low enough for your first anchor? I, I'm low enough. I think. I. I think if you. Uh, yeah. Think a, uh, it's a more limited window, but I. I, I think we're pretty low. Uh, yeah, I can see where you are. Yes, I would agree. And then there's three. I think there's four anchors there, right? Four anchors. You can see the repair looking from an anterior superior portal, and I think we did get a pretty good bumper there. Um, okay. So he not, I just want to, uh, uh, forgive me. He did go not ahead. have posterior pathology. Okay. If he did, you would have addressed that through something percutaneously? Yes. Okay. So, you know, there's not an anchors, not less anchors. I, I, think all, I think it's dealer's choice. I don't actually think there's one that's superior over the other. You just do what you're comfortable doing. Um, I, I think it's often said that it's hard to use the not less devices inferiorly. I'm not sure I agree when you're dealing with contemporary suture passing. I think you can use anything, whether it's percutaneous, knotless or knotted, you do what you're comfortable doing. Um, and um, you also mentioned one point about knocking out an anchor, Andrew. And I wonder, has that, that the knocking out an anchor especially happens when you're doing a posterior inferior and anterior inferior. Have you, any of you guys gravitated towards all suture anchors, for example, because of that risk? You know, there's that risk of fracture and otherwise. Have any, have any of you guys gravitated towards all suture versus uh, implant related? I only use all suture suture anchors, so those are that's what that's what that was in those cases. So, I'm, yeah. I'm, Albert, how about you? Yeah, I um I get a little worried with the uh, with the osteolysis reports of um of the all suture based anchor, so I, I I've stayed away from them. Okay, well we're going to learn the consequences of staying away from that soon, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so in Albert's patient, he uh, returned to sport six months, and uh, he had a recurrent instability event. And uh, he's now went from 17 to 18 years old. He still wants to play hockey. And uh, now Albert's beating himself up. He had a long discussion with the family. He made him wait. Uh, uh, no, no, he fixed his right away. Sorry. Uh, and uh, you got him when it was fresh. 
uh, uh, what, Albert, what goes through your mind? What are you thinking? Is this just bad luck? Uh, did you do the wrong operation because of his sport? Uh, he was certainly zero out of nine baitings, so you had that working for you, right? <laughs> so what'd you, what'd you, did you miss his baitings? What, so what I, happened? I'll tell you, you know, when, when, I, when I left that, uh, the, that OR, I thought, oh, I got, I got a nice anchor. It looked good. But, you know, I, this was a lot of early on in my practice as well. And I think there are some, some things in this high-risk athlete that I would really consider. I would re probably consider adding a remplissage in this. Uh, you know, Buddy Silva has got great um, literature on, on uh, doing that in, in, in this setting uh, with low recurrence rates. And then the, the whole posterior anchor of, um, you know, kind of reefing that entire um, sling, I think is something that I would, I, I wouldn't really hesitate doing, if, even if you didn't have posterior labral extension. Yeah, I think that's, that's I want to have you stop you on that point. Uh, Kevin and Andy, he made a very subtle but important point, I think anyway. Would you agree with what he just said? Uh, yeah, maybe in this population is more better, but spreading them out and maybe even going posterior inferiorly to get more of a balanced repair. Uh, do you, anyone take issue with that statement? I don't take any issue with that statement, but I'm not so certain, Albert, that you did anything that anybody wouldn't have done. You, you know, this is a high risk 17 year old playing a very violent sport. And I'm not so certain that any soft tissue procedure, any soft tissue procedure is going to prevent him from redislocating. Um, yeah. You want to call that bad luck, you can call it bad luck, but I'm not so certain it was technical. So uh, this would be bad luck, I think. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you look at this carefully, you'll see that there's now a fracture. And unfortunately, when you're in practice long enough, any, all of you are going to see this. And um, you're gonna, you can't help yourself but feel responsible at the same time because you put the anchors in and it created a stress riser and he fractured right through there. And you're saying, you know, what could I have done differently? And, you know, it is very common to use three or more anchors. It's very, this configuration is extraordinarily common. And other than maybe switching anchors and so forth or smaller drill holes, I'm not sure that this is exclusively avoidable. Uh, in fact, uh, Alvo was kind enough to, to include this article, which showed the risk factors. But the challenge is these are the risk factors for this are the risk factors for recurrence in general. And, and really, this is just, uh, you get it in the right way. There's a stress riser, and this guy has a fracture. And I don't know that anyone's shown it more common. This, all suture anchors haven't been around long enough probably actually know if we're actually doing any better, quite frankly, uh, or worse, because some people report osteolysis. But nonetheless, he had uh, a fracture. He, uh, Albert got a, a CT scan, and um, you saw that. You can see it here. And it, the stress rises right through where the three anchors are in line here. So I want to just ask all, uh, uh, Albert, you're going to show us what you did. So Kevin, uh, do you re-repair this, or do you go right to a bone augmentation procedure and say, "I'm not, my risk, I, I don't, I can't tolerate failing again"? What would you do? I think in in this setting with a high-level athlete, high-profile athlete, I, I would go right to a to a ladder J. I think the risk of failure revision is still going to be very high, and, and I think. Ladder J it certainly makes me sleep better at night to, to address the bone issue. Kevin, have you ever had an athlete, and I don't want to jinx you, you're going to tomorrow's <laughs> party, you can still be going to the office, but have you ever had a contact athlete fail a Ladder J? I have not, no. Okay. Uh, Andrew, what about you? No. Oh. And would you do uh, repair? I, I, did you get a sense of the anatomy here? Um, just give you a sense. Would you say, look, let's do arthroscopic repair, maybe add something, augmentation? Uh, of this bony fragment, because yeah, you know I, you'll be able to fix it arthroscopically. Uh, but or would you say, look, I'm done. I'm going right to a, a ladder J. I don't know that I'd go right to a ladder J. I don't think it's wrong to do an open bank cart and maybe incorporate some of that fragment. I, I'm not sure if it, if you can. If you if you went in and you saw that that fragment, you know, was really nothing, just mush. Um, yeah, then I think in that case you probably do want to augment the glenoid with a coracoid transfer or something, but I'm not so certain it's wrong to go in with the concept that you may be able to uh, uh, do a, a straight open bank cart repair. Again, so, uh, right. so Ryan, uh, yeah, Ryan please, got please. a question. What recurrence and stability rate do you guys quote your patients currently after an arthroscopic capsule label repair for recurrent anterior instability? In this population specifically, we'll stick to that. Uh, sure. That's a great question. Uh, uh, Albert, can you just give me the number, please? Usually uh, Albert, my, 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 I imagine your numbers evolved since you've been in practice. But where are you today? 15% <laughs> about. Okay. Uh, Kevin? 
Yeah, I usually say 10%, but I'm probably underestimating it. And uh, Andrew? Yeah, no, I, I, I would estimate it. Albert, at least 15, maybe even 20, 25% if you look at the literature on contact collision athletes. Yeah, I think uh, that my answer is, I guess the other thing is you got to make sure we're always comparing apples to apples because you're going to see lots of these, uh, you're going to see lots of these uh, outcome studies, but we have to know what people are doing. But I would, I would argue that 15%, I would pr provide that information for someone going back and maybe it's protecting ourselves, maybe we're not. That's a good middle of the road number. I like that number. Uh, the bottom line is it's clearly not zero. So Andy, unfortunately, you had a similar situation. Um, uh, your your guy. Uh, had, so let me just. What uh, Albert did is he did a arthroscopic repair of the bone fragment, and he um, also added a remplissage. And I'm going to leave the discussion of remplissage out of the equation right now, if that's okay. Um, and he's had no recurrence. Uh, Andy, you were in a similar situation where yours reoccurred uh, 11 months out, and um, now you uh, the CT scan is a little different. Uh, that's that same fellow who had the CT before. Uh, what's your explanation of this change? He's, he, he's, he was doing fine and then he redislocated, but now he looks like this. What are your thoughts? So prior to this, um, he's come out several times. So he, he, he dislocated and then had repeated subluxations, I believe it was. So yeah. uh, I, I think you have attritional bone loss at this point. Yeah. And I, I think that's the case. And this is the argument that people will often make. Why do we get bone loss over time? And certainly you can have acute. And I would say that uh, Albert's case is not really a bone loss case. The Albert's case is a fracture case, but there's bone loss that happens acutely, then the fracture heals and then it's out of position or we see it over time as we're seeing in uh, Andrew's case where this, now this athlete is a totally different picture with multiple recurrences after previous arthroscopic uh, treatment. And you know the, you'll see well, all kinds of charts. This is a, this shows some pretty contemporary data. I think Gus, that was a, that was the series. Of, was that when you were at Rush the 05? Was that no five? Was that when you were you there then? Was that after? Uh, 2001, 2002, buddy. That's why I have to ask my PA. I have such a bad memory. So <laughs> so, uh, but look, that's that's the I, I quote the 15 percent from that study. How's that? But you can see in collision group. Uh, it's not, it, it, while it might be shameful, uh, this is still the numbers we're seeing. And this is what I think polarizes people between open and arthroscopic is there still is a group of individuals who treat uh, traumatic injury. You're seeing three sort of arthroscopic oriented surgeons here, four even my, including myself, uh, that we think we can do the same arthroscopically, but no question, you do what's best in your hands. And there is a, uh, a strong group of individuals who take care of collision athletes who uh, still do open stabilizations for first time traumatic instability. And, and you shouldn't be ashamed of doing that. So now we've got Andy's case of uh, recurrent instability with bone loss. And I'd like quick answers. Uh, Albert, uh, how will you handle this case uh, and, uh, and why, please? Yeah, I think um, this one, I, I wouldn't go back to a revision um, uh, um, arthroscopic approach uh, just because this looks attritional in nature. Um, it's a little bit different than, than mine in which it was kind of an acute fracture. Um, and I think I would, I would go either open bank or Latterge. And I think given if he's going to participate, continue participating in collision sports, I probably would, would probably go towards a Latterge if I'm going to open. Kevin? Yeah, my practice has evolved in the last 10 years where this is a lot, would have been a revision bank heart. Now it's a ladder J. Okay. And uh, Andrew, you did just that. And uh, you did a ladder J. And I want to ask all of you now, because I think there seems to be, um, if, we, if we track, and I haven't seen the last article that cited the increasing incidence of ladder J's, but clearly outside of the U.S., we, we've caught on. It's a lot like the biceps. Uh, people are, the threshold to do something with the biceps became very, very low. Now we've got something, a threshold, people are so afraid to fail, and rightly so, that the decision to do a ladder J is probably happening sooner. So I want to uh, ask Andy, you did that for this treat treatment. If you could just, I want to ask you just three things about it. Uh, number one, where do you split your subscap? Uh, between upper two thirds and lower one third. Okay. And uh, do you ever change it based upon the amount of bone loss? Is there, any, is there anything you ever change, or you just say lower one third, upper two thirds? That's where you go in. No, you know, you know I, I, I think. Uh, it wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be affected by the amount of bone loss. No. Andy, I love looking at you, but do me a favor. Turn your camera off because I'll hear you better. I want to hear you. You want to hear me? <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind. I think I can hear you perfect. So, um, Andrew, and my next question is what about the capsule? Do you put the capsule 
uh, intraarticular intra or extra, you know, and relative to where the coracoid is? It's a vertical capsulotomy. Uh, it's incorporated with the, I leave a remnant to the CA ligament. Uh, and uh, the, the, the graft is going uh, uh, at, at, the, at the side of the split. Uh, so the capsule and uh, 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 remnant CA ligament are incorporated together. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would make it in theory extra because you're going to the, uh, to the CA ligament. Okay, yeah. rotation of the coracoid process. Uh, do you do a safe arc or do you just put no. it uh, flat? French technique. Okay, uh, anyone else uh, you want to do, would do different? Uh, Albert or Andrew or uh, Kevin, excuse me, do you do anything different at the subscap? The only thing I would say differently, and I, you know, this is just something I learned from Walsh was, uh, you know, if they have some at laxity, just split it um, at one half, one half instead. I don't know if there's any literature to really support that, but otherwise I'd do the same thing, split two thirds, superior one third. Uh, inferior. Okay. And uh, okay. rotation of the coracoid, are you going flat against the glenoid? Flat, yeah. Okay. And uh, Kevin? I do a congruent arc typically. Do you have any problems with screw fixation ever if you get a very narrow coracoid and trying to get you know, if you're off a little bit, that was my, that's always been my concern. Yeah. Again, I've never had anyone fail yet uh, 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 with a, 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 a latter J. So I, the times I tried congruent arc, I had some drill hole issues just because it could be very narrow. Yes. Does that ever guide your decision making? I, I haven't changed, but I've had one or two cases where uh, it definitely uh, I had some some nerves going with the first drill hole that airballed it seemed like, and so yeah, I can see where that could happen. Tell me about screws. Uh, what type of screw do you use? Kevin? Uh, I use the, uh, the ladder J set by one of the companies. It's a solid, you know, solid screw, usually around 30 to 35. You usually try to get two screws. 3.5s? Uh, I think they're 3.7s actually. Okay, so nothing smaller than a 3.5. Is that Correct. fair to say? Correct. Uh, yes. Andrew, how about you? Screw size? Yeah, 3.75. They're usually about 36 millimeters in all. Okay, and uh, Albert, non cannulated? Uh, yeah, I use solid uh, stainless steel 4.0. Um, uh, partially threaded. Okay. And Brian, this one was Brian, before you continue, a uh, couple of questions from the audience, which are important here. What is the panel's uh, personal complication rate from Ladder J? Um, and are they significant? Do, do they change your thoughts? And two, does anyone uh, ever use um, a tibial allograft or does everyone use anterior glenoid, glenoid bone? Yeah, so um, our, our complication rate was published recently and we're around 5% as opposed to others who reported up to 20, 25%. And it's usually, we've had one or two permanent nerve, uh, but um, it's been 5% or less. And I know that's the argument against Latter J, but uh, uh, most of them are transient. And um, our distal tibia uh, utilization is uh, ba based on amount of bone loss, large, uh, most commonly, especially if they have a, a lot of pain associated with it. Uh, if it's a, uh, a significant amount of bone loss, and I'm not sure I can tell you what that is, but, uh, and it might even be the mood of the day, I haven't done one in a while because we've done well with both, quite frankly, uh, but there's a cost. And, um, but we're, we've seen integration with distal tibias and our, I'd say most of us have gravitated uh, for very significant bone loss where you really would like to have some cartilage uh, in our practice. Uh, Albert, uh, what's your complicated, your, ours was five. What were you guys at? What are you guys at, do you think? And some of us may not have looked at it that carefully. I think it's about 5%. We have not actually had anybody with any permanent nerve injury, but most of the issues are, um, you know, a graft not healing or osteolysis, um, um, those type of issues. Hey, Brian, do, you I wanted, use a distal, do you use a distal tibia ever? Um, I do in revision settings. Um, but I wanted to ask you, since your, since your outcomes are, you know, so similar with both, what do you make of the sling effect concept? I mean, do you think it, you think it's real? Um, or do you think, you know, because you guys have shown that DTA yeah. does just as well. Um, the answer is, I think, you know, certainly it's been looked at biomechanically, and I think there's something to it. But to your point, if I had to pick bone or sling, I'd pick bone before sling. Um, uh, Kevin, um, uh, distal tibia experience, do you do them? Yeah, yeah, I've done, I've done fair amount, usually in revisions, but, but also, you know, greater than 25% bone loss. It, it, I've had very good outcomes with them, so. And your complication rate for ladder J's? It's low. I can't think of any of the top of my head that were an issue, but I always walk out of there thinking I'm going to have some because that, that's, you know, it's never a straightforward operation. But yeah, it's, it's not that right. I can think of any. It's a bad day when they wake up and they can't flex their elbow. That's for sure. Uh, Andrew, how about yourself? I think similar to yours, Brian. Fortunately, we, we've avoided any major nerve is issues. I think like Albert's complications, we've seen more with 
non-union um, uh, fixation uh, issues, but um, not with the uh, nerve nerve injury. Um, I'm going to. Uh, more question gonna... from the from the audience is that if you when you're doing a scope, if you see a haggle, does it change it to an open procedure for you? Well, my answer is um, I'll I'll dabble a little with. Um, uh, uh, arthroscopic, but if I struggle at all, it's such a small, easy incision that I don't have any problem opening it. But they're kind of fun to do arthroscopic if you can get to them, but I don't think it matters. It's such an easy repair open. That one, I don't have any problem opening, uh, but I will tr I'll go in under with the intent of arthroscopic, and if I have to turn from the ladder to cubis and make them flatter, I'll do it and just do a small open. Uh, Albert, uh, open typically, or do you try arthroscopic first? Anterior, I'll just do it open, um, but posterior, okay. I think it's easier to do it uh, arthroscopic, actually. And Kevin? Yeah, arthroscopic and, and make sure I get a 70 degree scope available. Okay, Andrew? Open. Easy operation. Okay, open. And thank you. Okay, I just would like you, I want to finish up with this if I can. Uh, tell me uh, what is the, uh, Albert, uh, briefly, what is the ideal uh, indication for a uh, uh, REM plissage, please? Still, I mean, uh, obviously, the, the current indications I think most people use when you have an off-track lesion, um, you don't have a lot of bone loss, probably something less than 13.5%. Um, but for me, I think I've been using, utilizing this much more in the high-risk athlete. So the, the contact collision athlete, due to some of these, you know, the cases that Andrew and, and I showed and, and, um, and, and Kevin had a case too, um, I, I'm much more aggressive now with this with contact athletes. Okay. Uh, Kevin, uh, similar indications? Yeah, I mean, certainly any any large hill sacks, but uh, as uh, Albert said, I, I think there's something to be said for tethering the uh, humerus to the posterior capsule and, and the posterior cuff, and that even in contact athletes with small to minimum hill sacks, I, I'm very much more aggressive with doing a rim plissage in those athletes as well. Okay, Andrew, uh, when you're doing a rim plissage and an anterior for label repair, which do you do first? I put my... Uh, Put my anchors in for the remplissage first, pass my stitches, but I tie them at the end after I've done the bank call. Okay. Um, uh, Gus, I, I don't think we went long, but unfortunately we didn't leave time for a lot of questions. So do you want to go with a couple of questions that you've been uh, triaging there that, that, that the panel can answer? Yeah, go ahead, Ranjan. Well, we did most of them, but um, one of, one, a couple of other questions. When you treat the initial patient uh, non-operatively, how do you treat them non-operatively? And what, what, do you, what, what are your thoughts about when you allow them to return back to work? Or play, okay. Or play, sorry. So, yeah, no problem. Um, if it's work, they never go back to work, but they go back to play in two weeks. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, my, my short answer is I'm not convinced that immobilization does anything. Uh, I'll do a short term until pain goes away and I will go back as soon as two to three weeks because that's the reason I didn't operate. Um, uh, Albert, what is your answer to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that once they have pain, pain-free uh, motion, their strength is back. We actually have developed a pretty rigorous kind of return to sport protocol that we use for our labral surgeries. So that is something that I would do in these athletes um, to, 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 to get them back uh, to competitive sports. How quickly can you get a acute tear with dislocation, relocation, back to collision sport without surgery, do you think? You know, I mean... Some athletes, like you were saying, two to three weeks, we could get them back, um, uh, depending. It just really depends on sort of the level of pain that, that, that they're in. Kevin, if the athlete then says, I went back in three weeks, you should have kept me out longer, and I re-dislocated, maybe if you held me six weeks, I would have stayed in. What would you say to that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know any evidence to support that. So you know, I think once they've achieved motion and their strength's back and, and you've got them in a brace, then I think you've done your part to, to minimize the risk as much as possible. Yeah, that's usually the agent saying it at that point. Right. Uh, Andrew, how about you? So maybe my patient population is a bit different, but two to three weeks is really, I think, optimistic. You know, these, these a traumatic solar dislocation and a contact collision athlete is not a benign little injury. It can have a big uh, hemoarthrosis. And quite frankly, I, I, I they, they take a lot longer than I, than, than I think uh, you guys make it out to be, at least in my experience. And I don't make that decision about when they go back. I think that's a decision made uh, with physical therapists, people, trainers, people working with the athlete, and, and that's when they go back. But, but it could be a long time. It does, you know, two weeks is, is pretty quick, I think. Uh, yeah, it is. But I guess the question, let me phrase it differently. If you knew that they're, they had, like I think uh, Albert said, 
their emotions return, they have minimal pain. Any reason you can't get them back when they achieve that goal in terms, and, and, and they're fun, and they're highly functional. And it probably depends on sport. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's fine. I think if they're functional, full range of motion, no pain, I don't have a specific number of weeks or days of in course. mind. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, Ron John, any other questions? Does anyone in the panel use a HER test, hyperextension internal rotation for anterior instability? Uh, I don't. Anyone else? No, no, I don't. I'm not really. Mm -hmm. no, I, I have not used it personally. Uh, 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 Andrew, have you? Um, no. I think I might have to do my fellowship again. Yeah. <laughs> one, final, one final question uh, from Would any of the panelists use an open bank card procedure as their primary procedure? A great question. Probably should have even. Been. It's so funny because we've evolved so much that we just assume this is the norm. That's a great question to ask. So this will be panel specific. My answer is no. I think there's a role for it, particularly if you have, you know, uh, that kind of 10% or our zero talks about that kind of like that zero to 10% bone loss. Um, are, you talking that, acu are you talking acutely or chronic? It says uh, acute as your index procedure. For if I'll, say, an, yeah, I, I'll say absent of a bony bank card, no. Yeah, I, I would say not for absent of a bone, bone loss. Uh, I would say no too. Kevin? Yeah, I, I saw uh, Don Murphy texted that, you know, I'm, I'm in the generation now where many of us are not really getting trained on open bank card. So for me personally, arthroscopic bank card is I'm most much more comfortable with. So I don't really do open bank card much at all. Andrew? No, but after hearing Bill's discussion, the first the first one out of the gates, I think if I had a wrestler, I would think about it. <laughs> as I say, there's no shame in doing it open. You do what you do best, as we say. Any other question, Ron John, that's burning here? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you everybody for your time and efforts. And it's an exceptional session tonight. Thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone be well, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next Thursday night. Yeah, everyone next Thursday. Thanks, guys.